Tonight, we look at the issue of intelligent design with Dr. Stephen Meyer, director and senior fellow at the Center for Science and Culture at the Discovery Institute. He and his colleagues have been at the center of this growing debate about the teaching of evolution in American schools. He is the co-author of two books, including Darwinism, Design, and Public Education. He joins us tonight from Seattle. Dr. Meyer, nice to have you on the program, sir. Great to be with you, Tavis. Let me start with those two questions that I posed in, in the introduction, namely and simply, what is intelligent design and why is it so controversial? Oh, those are great questions. Uh, well, as to what it is, it's the theory or the idea that there are certain features of biological systems that are best explained by an intelligent cause rather than an undirected process like uh, Darwin's idea of natural selection. And uh, what, what features are we talking about? We're talking about things like the little miniature motors, the rotary engines, the turbines, the sliding clamps, this exquisite nanotechnology that scientists have been discovering in cells over the last 30 years. And it, we're also talking about something that's really interesting to me personally, which is the, uh, the digital code that's, uh, that is inscribed along the spine of the DNA molecule, the instructions that the cell has for building all of these little miniature machines in, inside the cell. So we've got code and we've got machines in cells and this looks to many scientists to be the evidence of an actual intelligent design, not an undirected process. So for my, for my mother who's watching in Indiana who doesn't have the degrees that you have or for that matter that I have, what you're really saying is that the human organism, that the human body is so intricate that there has to be something other than this mere process of evolution that makes us who and what we are? Right. I mean, we're not opposed to the idea of evolution per se, meaning change over time, but we are opposed, we are challenging, we are challenging the Darwinian idea that things uh, arose through a purely undirected process. We think that, there, that things arose by some kind of design, and you can see the evidence of that when you look closely at the cell, because you've got uh, as I said, again, this information encoded in DNA. We know from experience that uh, when you get a, if you, if you need a, a computer program, you need a computer programmer. In fact, we know that any time we find information, whether it's in the form of a, a hieroglyphic inscription or a, a newspaper headline, uh, invariably there was an intelligent agent behind that information. So when we find information encoded in the DNA in, a, in this four character digital code that is that's responsible for all the instructions in the cell, it's, an, it's a, the logical inference uh, and explanation to say that an intelligent uh, agent of some kind played a role in the origin of, that, of those living systems. Let me ask a question after this preface. What you I don't call, know if that helped your mother or not. Maybe well, there's still too many big words. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to ask another question I think yeah. might, might, might advance the conversation for her and others who are watching. Yeah. Um, let, me, let me put it this way then. What you call intelligent design, my mother and others might call God. So, so, uh, so, so let me ask two questions. One, if it is God we're talking about here, why don't we call it what it is, number one? And number two, if that's not what you're saying, what then is the distinction, the difference between intelligent design and, shall I say, creationism? Well, those are great questions. The, the key to this is the difference between the evidence and the implications. Okay. We're scientists and we're looking at the evidence and what we can tell from the evidence is that some kind of intelligence must have played a role. If you see an inscription, you see some written text, if you see software, you know that there was a programmer or, or an intelligence exactly. behind it. And that's what we got in the cell. Okay. Uh, now, the question as to the identity of that intelligence, that's a second question, a second order question. And uh, for people who have a religious belief, uh, this very well may support that religious belief. It's certainly, uh, God is certainly uh, a likely candidate to be the intelligent designer. We just, as scientists, can't prove that from the science. We can see that some intelligence played a role and uh, for the people who are religious believers, it's a natural thing to associate uh, the, their belief in God with, uh, with, with the evidence they see of design in life. But we're just trying to be accurate and careful about the science and say what we can tell from the science and what we can't. Fair enough. So President Bush steps into this debate some days ago and suggests that he thinks intelligent design ought to be taught in schools. Pick up the debate there and tell me uh, what you thought of that controversy that erupted when he had uh, to say what he said. Well, it kind of interrupted my vacation plans for August. I've been doing a fair number of these shows with yeah. your colleagues. But I'm glad to have you on. Yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, 
I, I mean, certainly one of the things we appreciated about the President's statement was that it was a clear statement of principle in favor of academic freedom. And we, what we're finding around the country is that many scientists who are challenging the strict Darwinian interpretation of life and scientists that are going further and even saying, hey, I, th I think there is evidence of design, are paying a price for that in their scientific careers. And we've been somewhat reluctant to say, hey, we want our theory required in the public schools because we've got scientists who have paid a price in the laboratory, in the universities, when they have spoken up. And at this point, I think we just want to get everyone calmed down and have a rational discussion about this before we try to, to push it into the schools. But we appreciated the President's support for the idea that, that it's a perfectly legitimate thing for students to learn uh, the, both sides or many sides of any, any controversial idea. All right, to this scientific notion then that you've put forth of intelligent design, and I like your analogy earlier that if you see software, you know there had to be a programmer, whatever his name is, whatever you want to call him, there had to be a programmer that put this software in place. If that, in fact, is your argument, and I accept that, I understand it, tell me what the, the argument is, essentially, that the critics make against intelligent design being taught. Hate to put you in, you know, in, in this spot of telling me what your critics say, sure. but, but, but as you interpret their argument, what are you hearing most fundamentally about why your critics don't want intelligent design taught in schools? Well, one of the things, the, maybe the most common thing that we hear is that it's, it's not a scientific explanation to say that intelligence played a role. But there are many sciences that do, in fact, infer intelligence. If you're an archaeologist, and you find an inscription in, a, in a, a piece of rock, if you're looking at the Rosetta Stone, for example, mm -hmm. you're, you're going to infer that an intelligence played a role. And it turns out that there are, there are developments in uh, some technical fields, complexity and information sciences, that actually enable us to distinguish the results from an intelligent cause uh, distinguish the results of intelligence as a cause from natural processes. And when we run those kinds of modes of analysis on the information in DNA, they kick out the answer, yeah, this was intelligently designed. So there is actually now a science of design detection, and when you analyze life through the, 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 the filters of, of that science, it, it implies, it shows that, that life was intelligently designed. So, what, what, one of the things we want to say to our critics is, look, we got to be open to whatever the answer is. We can't decide in advance that we're not going to allow certain kind of answers to be considered by scientists. The, the fundamental commitment that every scientist has is to follow the evidence where it leads, even if that leads to an uncomfortable conclusion, one that, you know, maybe your mother would like. Let, let, let me ask you then where you think this debate is headed. Increasingly, I saw the, the New York Times uh, op-ed page yesterday that was pretty much devoted almost exclusively uh, to, to this issue. This, this, this conversation continues to, uh, to take place around the country. Where is this conversation, this debate headed, as you see, where science and faith, science and God, science and religion are concerned? Where is this intersection? Wh where are we headed with this intersection? Are we headed for some catastrophic crash here? Well, I, I think, first of all, there's a lot of good science that's going to be done on the basis of, of the idea that life really was designed. I mean, the, the Darwinian idea is that things look designed, but they're not really designed because an undirected process called natural selection produced that, that illusion of design. And we've seen for 30, 40, 50 years now in biology that people actually approach the living cell as if it were an intricately designed system and then try to, they actually do reverse engineering in order to figure out how the cell works. So we think that there's going to be a lot of good science that's going to be done on the basis of, of the conclusion that life was designed. And so that's one thing that our institute is particularly focused on. As far as these larger questions, I mean, people are kind of free to draw their own conclusions, but I think increasingly people are reluctant to say, as they were at the, at the close of the 19th century, that there's a conflict between science and religious belief. I think increasingly people see that the two can go hand in hand in harmony, and in fact that there's some, some evidence that actually supports a larger uh, theistic perspective without necessarily being a proof of God's existence or something like that. Uh, let me ask you then a two-part exit question that might be a bit unfair, but forgive me in advance for asking it because I'm curious here. Tell me well, you what, gotta ask the hard questions, that's your job. Yeah, right? well, that, that is my job. Let, let, let me ask you then a two-part extra question. Part one, what is, and I think you may have already answered it, but I just wanted to get, this, get back on record here again and make sure I'm clear about it. What do you think is uh, the strongest argument that you all can make at this moment for intelligent design? And where do you think that you're a little shaky? Where does more work have to be done um, for you all to get the majority of Americans, or, or significant number of Americans, 
to accept the fact that intelligent design ought to be taught in schools. Where are you strong and where are you weak? Where are you shaky? Thanks. You know, maybe I should clarify first just that we're not asking for our theory to be required in the schools. Fair I think enough. If a teacher wants to talk about it right. voluntarily, they should. But we don't want teachers to get experience the kind of recriminations that some of our scientists have experienced. Right. I mean, we don't want teachers getting lynched over bringing an idea into the classroom. But we, of course, think they ought to be free to do that. Sure. But uh, on, the, on the science, I think this argument from information is extremely strong. I think people get it right away. I think more and more scientists are getting intrigued with the idea that we've got an information processing system and digital code in the cell. We've got to explain that. We haven't done that from an evolutionary standpoint, and yet it screams intelligence. We've also got a lot of little miniature machines that also look for all the world like something that was designed by very, very intelligent engineers. So I think those are very strong arguments for design. I think one of the things that we want to do to advance our research program further is start to draw out the implications of intelligent design for different aspects of biology. And that's going to take more research dollars, more uh, scientists devoting their, their career to that. And, uh, and we see we're, we're in the early stages of that, and we, we think there, there will be more uh, research coming that shows how fruitful intelligent design is for, for making other discoveries in science. Dr. Stephen C. Meyer, Director of the Center for Science and Culture at the Discovery Institute. Dr. Meyer, I enjoyed our conversation and uh, I suspect in the coming days, months and years we'll get a chance to talk about this again. I, I got a feeling I, this will be the last conversation. I enjoyed it too, Tavis. Thanks for having me. Glad to have you on the program.